Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. You look all bright and bushy tailed. <laughs> Hope you had a good rest and a good breakfast. And uh, we got a good day ahead of us. Um, I'm so happy um, to be able to um, welcome and int introduce to you uh, Brother um, Mark um, Platma. Um, he and his wife Gretchen and family have been serving in the Czech Republic since 1996, a long, steady um, ministry. And on the same theme, the theme of church planting and, and leadership development, and, uh, and a much quicker turnaround if, from what we might think of, of church planting, where you, one church does it once every 20, 30 years or something. <laughs> um, this is like, uh, as a, uh, you, you plant a church, and, and within two or three years, hopefully you've begun a, a nucleus of a, of a new um, um, faith community. And before, very quickly, they're also looking to plant again. And, and, and repeat that process. And when we were with um, Darko and I last um, spring, um, visited um, Prague and um, the Czech and the Slovak Republics and, and Mark and Gretchen, they hosted us in their home kindly. And we had a beautiful evening together <laughs> cheering for different, different hockey teams. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the next day, Tuesday, Mark took us on uh, around all the different churches over the, all those years that had been planted and were in different stages now. And it was just so, so exciting for, for us. I think it was exciting for him, too, because uh, it, it was a reminder of how God's faithfulness over the years. And so um, this is something we need to learn from. I, I came back with that idea. If this needs to be somehow translated into North America. Right? And anyways, without further ado, welcome, Mark. We're so glad you're here with us. And uh, oh, um, I know it's shortly you're going back. That's right. But, yeah. but God bless you, and thank you for sharing with us this morning. Thank Let me just pray as, as we begin. Father, I just um, we commit this time to you. Thank you for the, the, the spiritual food you have prepared and your servant who comes to minister in your name. Uh, bless him, Lord. Uh, bless his heart and, and encourage him as uh, you use him. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Stan. And I think maybe Stan had gotten a hold of my notes, knew what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the topic that I would like to share with you this morning. And uh, it's just such a great privilege. Yes, Stan, it was a great, great time with you and Darko. And uh, although it was a little difficult to know who to cheer for, the Czechs or the Canadians, <laughs> uh, it was all good. So, but we'll, uh, Gretchen and I will share a little bit more personally um, during the course of this weekend. But today, this morning, we'd really like to focus on the Word of God and we're going to be going right through scripture, so I hope we'll be done by what? We're supposed to go till uh, lunchtime, is that right? <laughs> okay. But um, okay, we'll be in Genesis, we'll be in Mark and Revelation, so just those three. Just those three places, but. Just three. Just three, but if you uh, uh, wanted to just think for a moment and uh, ask yourself if someone were to offer you a million dollars, would you say yes? course it would be to help out the Czechoslovak Baptist <laughs> mission work around the world but if someone said okay here's either a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars every day for 30 days for a month what would you rather take <laughs> yes because that's what three million dollars now what if somebody instead of hundred thousand dollars a day instead of a million dollars lump sum they said I'd like to give you a penny a penny and the second day two pennies the third day four pennies and by 30 days you can decide which one you'd rather have the lump sum the hundred thousand or the penny who would take the penny <laughs> a few people if you did you would end up not with one million not with three million but with over five million dollars after only 30 days and that is the power of exponential multiplication and multiplication is what we'd like to talk about through God's Word this morning just in the brief time that we have together and um, if you could take that penny and multiply it let's say for 365 days you would come up with the astronomical figure of 10 with a hundred and seven zeros behind it ten dollars to the factor of 107 we don't even have a name for that number that's how big it is 
But God wants to bless the world through multiplication. And we see that throughout the pages of Scripture. And what I would like for us to look at, the first passage is from the very first chapter of Scripture, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. And um, not only are we going to be talking about multiplication, but also talking about the nations and about blessing. God's blessing is through <coughs> multiplications and through the nations. Now, before there were nations, there were only two people, Adam and Eve. And this is what God said. We'll start with verse 26 and read through verse 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. <coughs> so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Mommy. Now many would say, and correctly <laughs> so, that the, the Ten Commandments are the first commands of Scripture, but yet long before God gave Moses those, uh, those uh, stone tablets on Mount Sinai, there were other commandments even before that. And yes, this very first command of God to man is right here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, when God says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Now, if you're saying, well, this is talking about, you know, getting married, having kids, and them having kids, you're right. It's a physical meaning, but yet in scripture, we always have a spiritual meaning, and that is what we're going to be looking at this morning as well as this spiritual concept of multiplication, spiritually multiplying ourselves over and over again by God's supernatural power. This was God's first command of Scripture. But before that was a blessing. And yes, it was the first blessing of God. God's God, it says in, in verse 28, God blessed them. And then we hear this command, maybe not so much of a command as a commission, just as we heard uh, from Pastor Stan yesterday when God told Abraham to, to go. Yes, in a sense, this was also a command to Adam and Eve to simply be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth. And there is that sense of going to all the earth and fill the earth. This was the charge, this was the commission that man received at the very beginning. And it's God's desire for each one of us. God is telling us that his plan, it's all about him. It's not about us and our plan or what we want to do. It's all about spreading God's glory to the nations, to the farthest corners of the world. In Habakkuk, Habakkuk we read that this prophecy, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We just want to shout out how amazing our God is. We want to join in what God is doing because he is on the move, brothers and sisters, and he wants to work in us and through us, through the church that Jesus Christ established. It's not only about making disciples, training leaders, planting churches. You may be surprised to hear that, but it's about making disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples. It's about training leaders who will train leaders who will train leaders. And it's about planting churches that will plant churches that will plant churches. It's all about multiplication. Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. And it, essentially that was Jesus' command as well to his disciples before he left. Go and make disciples of all nations. God is not just into addition, one plus one plus one, but God is into multiplication. And if you thought that was just a one-off statement here in the first chapter, it's not, because we read this command over and over again. You remember that God 
destroyed the earth with a flood because of man's sin and disobedience. But yet God spoke again to Noah in Genesis chapter 9. And in verse 1 we read that God blessed Noah. Again, there's the blessing. And his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I don't know about you, but I think God is trying to make a point here to all of us. God wants us to be fruitful, to be uh, multipliers, and to spread his glory, spread his fame over all the earth. And as we are connected with God through the Holy Spirit and following Jesus' command, we will multiply what we have. How? By giving to others what God has given to us. And what are some of the characteristics of this multiplying movement of making disciples and training leaders and planting churches? First of all, we need to have a rock-solid faith in God's promises. It's God who is doing the multiplying. It's not a man-made effort. It's not something that we can try to make happen. If we work hard enough or force things our own way, that's not God's plan. It is a plan of trust in Him. Secondly, it's a commitment to the unwavering authority of God's Word. God is the source of all of our belief and our practice, and we're to guide disciples into this way. We're to train leaders according to God's Word. We're to establish churches that are biblically grounded. And thirdly, it is a movement of prayer, fervent prayer, that God would move among the nations and among the peoples of the earth and prayer is the fuel of missions when the church prays the earth shakes and that's what we'll be talking about on Sunday morning as well and since that time when Jesus said I will build my church and the gates of hell will not even prevail against it the church of Jesus Christ has grown exponentially just started with a ragtag bunch of 12 disciples who were just afraid and had a lot to learn. But it grew to 70 followers, and then 500, and we read in Acts, uh, 3,000 in one day, and then 5,000. And before you know it, tens and <coughs> hundreds of thousands and millions. And uh, most missiologi missiologi uh, missiologists would estimate evangelical believers those who are true followers of Jesus Christ would number approximately 500 million, half a billion for true followers of Jesus. And in the, in the largest sense of Christendom, everyone who would simply check off a box on the census that they are in some way a Christian, we know that they're not all born-again believers, but they would represent 2.2 billion people, about one-third of the world's population would in some way connect with uh, this uh, Christianity. We also heard an amazing challenge yesterday from Pastor Stan about God's call to Abraham and also the amazing promise that was connected with that, this sevenfold promise and this seventh, which was the most amazing of all is that through you, Abraham, all the nations, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And this was God's plan through Abraham, through someone who was 75, not even able to have kids with Sarah, and God promised this, that through Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah, and then through the line that led to Jesus, that God would unfold his plan and promise to redeem the world by sending his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Perfect son of God born of a virgin, living and walking among us, suffering and dying, and taking upon himself the curse of the whole world, paying the price for our sins, making us right again with the just and holy God, restoring the relationship that was broken through the sin of Adam and Eve, and all who would receive him through faith, that same faith that Abraham had when he obeyed God, when he believed in God, all who believe on him, all who believe on God's promises, on his power, on his provision, on his plan, God gives them the right to become the children of God. And this promise is now available to each 
and every one of us. This promise is not just for us in this room, not just for this at the conference, not in Meadville or only Pennsylvania, not even North America, but this promise is for the whole world, for every single nation and people group and language and tribe. This message is for everyone. This gift is available to receive for every man and woman and child on the face of the earth. All, through faith, would be blessed through that act of obedience of Abraham. And what would start with one man of faith, Abraham would begin to multiply. Two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. And you know how the math works. And this is the concept of multiplication. God said to Abraham, look at, look at the stars of the sky. Look at the sand on the sea, the dust. You're not even going to be able to count your descendants. That's how many you will have. And today we can't count them. There are so many. I will multiply you greatly, God says. And God's call in multiplication is also clear. As we heard yesterday and as the theme of our conference, the call is to go. We know that mankind did not obey that command in chapter 11 before God called Abraham. They were simply trying to make a name for themselves. They were trying to go up instead of spreading out. And God chose to mix up their languages and to remind them once again of that all-important call and purpose of mankind. All we need to do is to look at the book of Acts to see how that multiplication worked. <clears throat> it was in uh, Acts 2 verse 41, the Lord had 3,000. Two chapters later, we read, read 5,000. Chapter 5 verse 12, we read that multitudes were added. And then something begins to happen. We don't really hear about addition anymore after chapter 5. We begin to hear this word multiplication after verse six, chapter 6. And this is what's interesting. Chapter 6 says that the number of disciples was multiplied. Multiplied. Exponentially growing. Then we come to chapter 8 because many of them still wanted to stay together in Jerusalem where it was safe and where they could all be together. And God had a different plan. Through His sovereignty, Persecution came to the church. Many, many were killed and, were, and suffered. But what happened is that the believers scattered. And they scattered throughout that whole known world. And everywhere they went, they brought the gospel with them. And this has happened over and over again. As we know in, from the 1950s and 1960s, Chairman Mao in China decided to try to destroy Christianity because the Christians were all concentrated on the coast. And he would send pastors, he would send elders and Christians to far-flung places of his realm to destroy the church. But yet everywhere that, that Chairman Mao forced Christians to go, they would bring the gospel with them. And Christianity spread throughout China, even despite, or maybe through, persecution. God has his plan. God has his way, an unstoppable multiplication of disciples, multiplication of leaders, but also a multiplication of churches. If you can imagine, Acts chapter 16, verse 5, it says that the churches were strengthened in their faith, this is Acts 16, verse 5, and they, the churches, increased in number daily. Now there is some debate, what is the pronoun they speaking of what is being increased in numbers daily but most Bible scholars would agree that this is speaking about what is referred to in the first half of the ver first half of the verse which is the churches the churches grew and strengthened and increased in numbers daily not just believers not just leaders but actual churches being established every day can you imagine that that explosive exponential growth of the church and that's why the Apostle Paul said he wanted to take the gospel from where it is known to where it is unknown because he says I've preached the gospel everywhere it doesn't mean that every single person he spoke to became a believer in Christ but everywhere he went local bodies of believers were established 
the gospel went forward and it was time to move on. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying. In uh, Mark's gospel, we also find that concept of multiplication, the very well-known parable uh, of the sower. We read that uh, the various types of soil and yet the seed that fell on good soil. <laughs> it's a sign. <laughs> what happened? What happened? When the seed was sown on good soil, these are the ones who hear the word and accept it, they bear fruit. How much? 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Jesus spoke of this exponential multiplication. And another one that ties in with the passage that we had last night, again from Mark chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 29, I'll read from 28, where Peter began to say to him, to Jesus, see we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Think of the sacrifices that those who have left one city to go to another city to start a new church or to follow God's call, those who have joined or started a new mission or ministry in another region, or those who have crossed the seas into other countries, learning a new language and helping to start new churches. Yes, they have said goodbye to family and friends, but God has blessed them a hundredfold more with so many new brothers and sisters in Christ, spiritual children, and even new churches that are continuing long after the missionaries are gone and evangelists are gone. These churches continue to reach out to their communities and continue to preach the gospel faithfully, winning men and women, boys and girls, to faith in Christ. And yet it doesn't come easily. It does come with persecution. It's not something that we should avoid. It's not even something that we should pray for and ask God for persecution. I don't believe in that, but that we should expect it. And as Peter says, not to be surprised when it does come, because this is also part of that whole plan or the whole process of multiplication. Now, we're so used to counting, we're so used to adding in our culture that we don't really see I'll be very honest, in North America, whether it's Canada or the United States, we don't see an explosive multiplication of churches being planted, leaders being trained, disciples. Yes, people are coming to faith in Christ. Praise the Lord for new leaders and pastors going out, even new churches that are planted. But it's not the multiplication that we're talking. Very hard to find even a small handful of examples in North America. And friends in Europe, it's even worse. It's very difficult. One of the most difficult mission fields. They say that Czech Republic is the graveyard of missionaries. And uh, I know from personal ex ex uh, example that now we have had, except for Gretchen and me, with our mission, we have had 100% turnover of missionaries. Mm -hmm. None of the missionaries that are with us right now uh, were with us at the beginning. And so, yes, it's very difficult. I'm not saying that they all quit because of uh, it was too difficult but for many many number of reasons a very very difficult mission field and not seeing a lot of results I would love to stand up here and say tell you that it's a multiplication of ministry in the Czech Republic we are struggling too and we're learning and we're trusting God and praying for his blessing so where is it happening if it's not happening in Europe and in North America we hear of this happening in other countries especially in Africa and in Asia. Now, as the immigrant population is on the move, as we all know, then we also see this happening in Europe and in North America. Some of the fastest growing churches or denominations are within 
ethnic minority groups. And we had the privilege, as elders, first of all, we prayed that God would bring a ethnic minority group that could use the Skalka church facility on Sunday afternoons and meet there. And after a very short time, we went, came in contact with the Mongolian believers in Prague and who were desperately looking for a place to worship every Sunday to reach out to their friends. I didn't know anything about Mongolia. In fact, we don't even speak Mongolian, but we found out that in 1989, the same year that communism was overthrown in the Czech, Czechoslovakia and in Mongolia, there were only four known believers in all of Mongolia. And that was just 27 years ago. Now put on your seatbelts. This is the concrete example of multiplication. The, uh, one year later, there were 10 Christians. And the next year, approximately 20 believers in the whole country of Mongolia. By 2006, there were around 6,000 6, believers. And today in Mongolia, 70,000 evangelical Christians in Mongolia. Churches everywhere, people going. And we can be thankful for the Lord. This is a supernatural, explosive, exponential growth of the church. And we can also be thankful to our South Korean brothers and sisters who saw Mongolia as their mission field. And much of Mongolia has been evangelized by South Korean missionaries. A country that 100 years ago was almost all Buddhist. And now it is one of the most Christian nations on the earth. God is on the move. Something is happening. We don't see it as much as we could imagine if we were in other parts of the world, but we can see it in the ethnic Mongolian populations. We have baptisms now together. We uh, have one baptism, uh, two Czechs and five Mongolians. The next baptism, one Czech and six Mongolians. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's amazing. <laughs> We're seeing them reach out to their countrymen, much like the Czechs and Slovaks here when their when their countrymen first came, avoiding persecution and, and looking for a better life in North America. They often welcomed them at the airports even. And this is what the Mongolians are doing. Um, we have uh, a meal for you in our home. We have uh, a group that meets here and we can meet your physical needs, help you get settled. And we also have a place on Sundays where we meet. And so many of them coming from paganism, shamanism, uh, from uh, a mixture of Satanism and Buddhism, now recognizing that Christ is the Savior of the world. Response rates are amazing. What Czech people, they often need a lot of time to process and think and to rationalize, and then maybe after six months or a year, they might say, oh, maybe not. <laughs> okay? Or they would commit to follow Jesus and become a very strong, committed believer. And again, we're not talking about hundreds or thousands of checks, but one by one we see this working. Mongolia is just one example that we know, but as we see in Revelation, and we can turn to that now, chapter 7, verses 9 to 12, we see this picture of God's plan for the nations at the end of time. Revelation chapter 7. As John Piper has so rightly said, why does missions exist? Missions exist because worship doesn't yet. Worship is ultimate. Missions isn't. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. We won't be doing missions in heaven. We won't be doing evangelism in heaven. But we will be doing <coughs> worship forever, for eternity. And now our task is to win worshipers from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And this is the vision that, that John had um, for the end of time. And John said, starting in verse 9, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb and all the angels who are standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen. 
blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this is the ultimate reality though, that awaits all of us who believe. Together with representatives, literally from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, worshiping before the throne. But we're not there yet. That hasn't happened yet. And until that time, our task is still ongoing to go to the nations and be obedient to, great, to the great commission call of winning worshipers. Jesus always had a God-sized vision. Jesus could always see farther than the disciples. And Jesus said that the gospel of his kingdom would be preached to all nations as a witness to all people. And then the end will come. So as we wait for that last representative of that last tribe, we rejoice that God is doing his work and that this process is continuing. Um, as I said, this process is not happening as much as we would imagine or like in, the, in North America or in Europe. But how can we move from this addition to multiplication? And we have to change our thinking from a seating capacity. We love to count, as, as they call it, butts in the seats. <laughs> okay? And that is great. It's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have to remember that's addition. That's addition. How do we move from addition to multiplication? Moving from what is good to what is great. And as J.D. Greer said, it's all about sending capacity. Not just seating capacity, as he describes it, but sending capacity. Can our churches, can our small groups, can our leaders uh, change from a seating capacity to a sending capacity? Is it possible? I believe it is. That all of us, as we have a ministry, we're looking at who can I bring alongside to mentor, to encourage, to lead, to train. Perhaps our ministry will multiply. Perhaps our small group will multiply. Perhaps our Sunday school will have even more departments. Perhaps even more people in our neighborhood will find out about the gospel that is being preached right in our church. These are the concepts that uh, are part of this sending capacity. Also celebrating those who go from our midst to other places and uh, not, not being maybe begrudging the fact that they've chosen not to stay in our church but to perhaps have even a greater or more effective ministry in another place, another province, another city, or in another country. Because that is how God multiplies his church, is through sending and multiplying. Also, as Pastor Stan said, it is increase, or decreasing this, uh, this uh, turnover rate of maybe 20 to 30 to 40 years before we plant a new church maybe two or three or four years. How is that possible? Again, very, very difficult, but waiting on the Lord for the move of the Holy Spirit, that people would come to faith in Christ, that they would desire to grow spiritually and would desire to form new bodies of believers. And this term is called a church planting movement. And we cannot see this happening necessarily, um, as I said, in North America too much or in Europe, except for in perhaps the ethnic minority groups. But first of all, uh, church planting movement is defined as a rapid multiplication of indigenous churches that sweeps through a people group or a segment of the population. First of all, it's rapid. It doesn't take much time. Planting of churches, again, not decades or even centuries, but just a few short years. Secondly, it's exponential. It's not just one plus one plus one, but it is multiplying. And thirdly, it is indigenous, that the people themselves in their own language, in their own culture, are able to reach out in the most culturally sensitive and appropriate way to their own people. Uh, David Garrison, if you're familiar with that name, he wrote the book, Church Planting Movements. He gives us an excellent picture of the growth of Christianity. As I said, 2.2 billion adherents to Christianity. That's much more than adherence to Islam, which is 1.6 billion, the second largest religious group in the, on, the, on the earth. 
Islam is growing faster than we could say historical Christianity, 1.9% versus 1.2%, but evangelical Christianity is growing even faster at 2.6% per year. Now in the Czech Republic, we're looking at about, uh, about 1 to 1.5% 1 evangelical growth, and one of our Christian leaders has said, if we continue with that same rate of growth, brothers and sisters, it's going to take us 175 years just to reach 1% of the Czech Republic. Can we be satisfied with that rate of growth? The answer is no. We need to trust God that we can move from an addition to a multiplication model. Now we can look around the world again, Christianity moving fastest in Asia and Africa. And what are the top 20 countries with the fastest rate of church growth in the world? Does anyone have a guess there? 19 of the 20 are in Africa and Asia. The top two countries with a growth rate, annual growth, growth rate of 11%. That means the church is doubling every six and a half years. Is China and Nepal. Very soon China will have more Christians than any other country in the face of the earth. Imagine that. More Christians than even in the United States of America. <coughs> Nepal also with tremendous persecution, very much like in China as well, even to this day. But yet, you'll be surprised that the next tier of countries with the greatest growth in the church are almost all Muslim countries. Let me give you the list. You'll be amazed. Yemen, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, now all with large expatriate communities, that's true, but yet growth of Christianity at around 8% per year. That means that every nine years, the Church of Jesus Christ would double in size in those Muslim countries. And we're just still talking about a very, very small fraction of the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. But yet, brothers and sisters, the tide is turning. And I'm not talking about news reports from last year or the year before, but news reports from last month, May, and from June 2016, that observers are seeing a massive turning to Christ of Muslims in Europe. Not hundreds, but thousands of Muslims who have just recently arrived, even within the last 12 months, and who have seen some of the horrific atrocities carried out in the name of their religion with not even enough Christians in Europe to evangelize them. And yet they're seeking out some of the deadest and most nominal churches and they're saying, I had a vision of Jesus. Can you baptize me? And some of the most liberal churches in Europe are saying, no, you're Muslim, that means you stay Muslim, you don't become Christian. And are turning them away and yet evangelical churches are saying, come, let us teach you who Jesus Christ is. Let us show you from God's word what the gospel really means. It's amazing. So many doubts of Muslims, and yet they are afraid to say that. Uh, I'm at, uh, spending the year in Windsor, that's where I grew up, and we have a Bibles for Missions, and some of the most uh, frequent and faithful customers to the Bibles for missions are Muslims, recent arrivals to Canada who are just buying used items because they're cheap. And I don't know if they understand the sign that says Bibles for missions because if I saw a store that said Quran for Islamic evangelization, I probably wouldn't go to that store. <laughs> but yet they're going. And one woman who works there just last month, she told me a, a woman came in the store completely veiled from front, from head to toe, with just a tiny slit for her eyes, and came right up very close to this woman and said, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. But don't tell anyone. My son is too, she said. Amazing, amazing what God is doing. We had a family in our church who invited a Muslim family into their home. Muslims from Iraq, not part of this 150 that we heard about, but previous to that, 
they came into their home, they shared a meal together uh, from the Skalka Church, and uh, kind of running out of things to talk about because of the language difficulty. So they found on the internet the Jesus film. And they just simply put the Jesus film on there in their own language that they speak in Iraq, and the husband and wife and the son and the daughter sat down, and the, the family left and just allowed them to watch for two, two and a half hours. And uh, when they came out of that room, they said, how did you like the film? What did you think? And they said, well, we prayed at the end to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are Christians now. We're followers of Jesus. We're no longer Muslims. From that moment, God did a miracle in the lives of those four people and brought them into faith in Christ. Friends, that has never happened to us in 20 years of showing the Jesus film to a Czech person. That just like that, it's very <laughs> difficult and there's a lot of questions and a lot of soul searching and a lot of uh, debating and a lot of uh, other things that go on with that. And yes, the Jesus film has been effective for the Czech population. But to tell you that Simply a Czech family of four has sat down at the end, all four of them prayed to receive Jesus. It hasn't happened yet. But yet this family, they came back to the Skalka Church a couple months later with one simple task, and that was to thank our church and to thank this family publicly. And the husband stood up in front of the whole congregation with, the, with an interpreter and said, we want to thank you as a church. We want to thank this family for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with because now we're followers of Jesus. We love him and we want to invite even more people to come into fellowship with him. I could go on. I could tell lots more stories. And I will this evening. But for now, perhaps we could just open it a little bit more. Because I'd love to have some feedback as well from you. This whole concept of addition versus multiplication. I don't want you to think that addition is bad. It's not. It's very, very good. But how can we move from addition to multiplication? How can we most effectively reach the nations, even right here in North America? How can we reach out to our Muslim friends and neighbors and coworkers with the gospel? Perhaps in the time that we have left, maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes, we can just simply shout out a few ideas, maybe some questions, anything that you might have on your heart, and something that might be also beneficial and edifying for the rest of us to hear as well. So if that is your uh, description of you this morning, then why don't you just share or ask or comment. really encourages me when you were talking was um, that missions in the Czech Republic is not just for the Czechs but for all the nations Genesis 1 Genesis 2 and that the multiplication uh, with our missionaries and all the other missionaries there is reaching the world through the Czech Republic that's right. Um, it's about the kingdom. It's not about denomination or uh, one race. It's about heaven, souls in heaven. And I, uh, I'm very encouraged. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. I think one thing that we can do is since maybe not a lot of the Muslims are going to the Czech Republic, but anyone interested in Muslim ministry and cannot get into some of these countries, we have a million Muslims in Germany who are hungry for the gospel. And the churches are woefully, inadequately prepared to reach them. We need missionaries to Germany to reach Muslims. Who would have thought even just a few short years ago? Brother well, Mark, how do you go about us planting a church what, what, did, what is your how do you, what are the steps? Yeah, okay. What are the steps? That's a very, very good question. Because if we read the church planting manuals for North America, or maybe go to the North American church planting conferences, it's all about 
planting a Sunday morning service. Yes. You got to get your big signs out and do a, a blitz of the neighborhood and have your launch Sunday, and everything just goes from there, right? Okay. Right. We do it completely flip it on its head, and we don't do that at all. <laughs> it might take us five years before we actually have once a week Sunday services. Yeah. We start with outreach, evangelism in the community. So targeting a community that has no Christian witness and begin to reach out, first of all, to the felt needs of the community and then the spiritual needs. They don't even know that they need Christ. But in a very culturally sensitive way, we want to present Christ to them. And people do come to faith in Christ. And the 10th district, we prayed for 10 people from the 10th district for the 10th district. And God blessed us with 14 new believers after a year and a half. And from there, the desire that they have of themselves to gather together and to learn. And we suggest, well, how about Sunday? <laughs> okay? They don't know. They don't have that as part of their thinking. And then it's also, how about if we all support this work ourselves? You mean like with, with money? <laughs> yeah, how about that? So all of it's new. Everything's new. And that's what's so exciting for us is planting a church where there is no church. Uh, also, training up leaders who have never led before. That is a daunting task. And, uh, right now, uh, I'm sure that uh, Stan would remember, but Petr Shetty is, is no longer the pastor of Svalka Church, but now he is going to Kutna Hora to be senior pastor of the Kutna Hora Church. And I have been mentoring him for eight years. It wasn't easy. There are a lot of different things along the way. But uh, now we're so thankful for Petr. We're going to miss him at Skalka but God is bringing someone else in to take his place. And so we can see that from very young, inexperienced uh, outreach workers, pastoral interns, training them and mentoring them to become uh, the men, the women of God that God is calling them to be, and then releasing them. And when they go, not to try to hold them back, but to bless them and to commission them and to champion what they're doing, to follow them, and not seeing them as some kind of you know, traitor who has left our church to go to another church. No, to celebrate that as a victory of our church that we have sent out one more leader to increase God's kingdom yet again in another place. And I think we can be grateful. Even uh, churches that are smaller and perhaps some of their young people are going to different places, but if we know that they're going on for the Lord and making an impact in the various communities and places that they're going, we can rejoice in that, even if we don't see explosive growth in our little church that we happen to be in. So that was a roundabout answer to your question. <laughs> and on the back seat, that then, do you have some um, institute uh, for your Very good question. families that you're sending out there? Mm -hmm. And of course, I know it's in children's ministries. Do you have? Are you at the same time working on training ladies to work with children? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Well, once again, when we start a new church, there's no Sunday school, there's no youth group, there's nothing. Right. So then Gretchen ends up being a Sunday school teacher for four children. Those are our four <laughs> uh, teens. We had a youth group at Skalka with uh, three teenagers, our son, our daughter, and our son's unbelieving friend. So when they, when they go to a new church uh, here in Canada, there's like 10 people in the youth group like, oh, this oh is so goodness. big. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but yet, um, a part of uh, being a missionary kid as well is that once there is someone who's come alongside Gretchen and who has learned what it means to teach Sunday school, or someone who's come alongside those youth workers and multiplied that ministry, it's time for us as missionaries to move on. And uh, the very delicate balancing act for a missionary is how not to stay too long in one place, but how not to leave too quickly for a still a fragile, um, a fragile fellowship of believers. So it's a really a balancing act. I think for us it's been around five, six, seven years, but yet in other places that you hear about, that turnaround could easily be 18 months. You hear about missionaries from the Philippines, oh yeah, we, Went to church every 18 months. How about you? <laughs> it's God is at work in different different ways in different places. But also training church planters. We've been praying about this for many years. 
and God put this in the heart of several uh, several men from different denominations, including the Baptist uh, um, denomination in the Czech Republic, that we need to train church planting teams. And with the help of a group from Norway, uh, we started what's called M4 Church Planter Training. And uh, the M4 training simply means that they come together for four weekends, these teams, over the course of two years. They're trained, they receive a coach. So I was on the um, uh, steering committee of this uh, this training process, but as well I was a coach for two of these teams. And we prayed for 12 church planting teams and God sent 18 church planting teams that were trained and went out. And we didn't think there'd even be interest for a second round, but now a second round has just begun and there are 12 more. So a total of 30 teams have been sent out to the Czech, throughout the Czech Republic and Slovak Republic um, who are planting new churches where there is no church. So this training is so important. Not just sending them and leaving them there, but as a coach, I would go to that place, and I was a coach actually for the, if you know the uh, Brno Baptist Church downtown, they planted a church called Medlanki in the northern part of Brno, and I was the coach for that particular um, new church plant. Meeting with the leaders, uh, meeting with the believers, encouraging them maybe about once every six months. And so there's that ongoing process even after the training has has done has been done. Mark, you talked about um, often with the Czech people there's it's a process. Yes. There's lots of discussion, dialogue and everyone's different, but are there one or a few things that you find that are common hurdles or obstacles in people uh, receiving the gospel and Mm -hmm. Very good question. What are some of the obstacles? Well, if it were a predominantly Roman Catholic country, like we had missionaries from from Poland or from Austria, or even someone say, "Oh, I'm Catholic," you know, end of discussion. I'm Catholic. Mm -hmm. Well, we're thankful we don't have that because Czech people say, "I'm an unbeliever." Sem or um, they just say, "I'm bez viznani," like without any faith system. So again, we see those who are. Uh, very convinced atheists, but also those who are kind of open. I'm an unbeliever, but I'm open. So I like to find out more about Jesus, find out more about not not um, Muhammad, they don't really, but about, of Buddha or of uh, the you know different cults, but yet not embracing any worldview or world system, but saying there must be something out there. So if you took 80% of the population that does not claim any belief in God or religious affiliation, one of the largest atheistic or unbelieving populations in the world, you could divide that right down the middle. So 40% are what you'd call convinced atheists, but 40% are also just kind of free thinking, new age, open to any kind of somethingist, we call them. Now, for the atheist, a good approach is the modernist uh, apologetic approach, sharing the facts of the authority of the Bible, reliability of scripture, the existence of Jesus Christ, his teachings in a very matter of fact way and showing through a kind of a scientific rational approach why Christianity is true. But yet when we go to the new age postmodern thinker, for some reason that doesn't work because they think that's your belief and everybody has their own belief and we explained that to someone, this woman, who's very into New Age, and the light came on, aha, after this whole explanation, now I know why you believe. Now I finally know why it's good for you. I know why you're happy now. It makes sense. Everything makes sense. Oh, I wish I could find my truth, just like you found your truth. It doesn't work. And for there, it's a much harder approach, and it is one-on-one -on -one friendship evangelism developing relationships and developing trust. And the apologetic, modernist way, we can have large rallies and lectures and even books and literature, but when it comes to the postmodern, it comes down to one-on-one, -on -one. and it's a long process of trust and friendship and relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, our time is almost gone. Just want to remind you, many of you are getting our letters and also they're in the Glorious Hope, but if you want to get them personally in your inbox or mailbox, we have, this is our latest, 
here and then our brochure that we put out at the beginning of this year. If you'd like to put our picture on your fridge, we do have magnets as well. I just have a few here, but we'll have them at the back of the auditorium as well. So let me pray together as we, as we close our time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings to the nations. Just as you have blessed the nations through the promise to Abraham and the Great Commission promise, and through your church, which expanded exponentially, now you have chosen to use us as your messengers, as your instruments, as your vessels to bring peace where there is no peace, to bring hope where there is no hope, in the light of the gospel where there is darkness. And so we pray, Lord, that you would equip us and enable us to be those multipliers, multipliers of believers, of disciples, of uh, leaders, and even of new churches, wherever you have placed us, but also wherever you send us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would send us from this place with your blessing and with your peace through Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great rest of the day. And just stop and talk to us anytime. If you have any more questions over the next few days. So, I'd love to talk with you some more.